that's uh, time, you know, and we can fool around here because it's Monday, and I have a, I have a direct uh, clue that because it is Monday, there exists a kind of vacuum, you know. Um, there's no question about it, but what every one of us feel a vague sense of the disappointment that it didn't work out over the weekend. I mean, like it didn't really happen, you know, <laughs> which leads me to believe that we suspect all the time that it never really will happen or that if it does happen, we will have just turned the corner and will have missed it. Thereby, oh, yes, there's no question about it. The, 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 the listening audience, the world, the, the, the firmament is filled with guys who figure they were born either 40 years too late or 40 years too soon. Really? Uh, you read, you read in the paper about the fact they're going to put some guy in the moon in the year 2074, and you feel cheated. And you read about Nelson <laughs> at, at Trafalgar, and you feel cheated. And so, I mean, you know, it, it, it builds up. It's mid of a chevy, you know, for crying out loud. Why am I born at this time? Forty-five years ago, I'd have been Fred Allen. You know? Crying out loud, 28, uh, and so it goes. But, of course, uh, we're living in good times. One of, one of the things we're living that I think in, we're living in a time where every knothead has his right to make comments about the conditions and the situation that is, and they're all given good, solid weight in the press. Every knothead is, is, is uh, can, uh, All you have to do is get yourself a good agent and a couple of good one-liners about the Kennedy administration, and, Dad, you got yourself booked from coast to coast in every hip nightclub you can find. No problem. You know that, Bob? You're in the wrong business. I'm serious about it. And, and you know, uh, there, there, there's all kinds of books coming out. There's one book on, uh, uh, on uh, a book on uh, the uh, secrets of creative positive anger or how to build yourself a nightclub act and seven easy golden rules to success and how to even get yourself an agent. True, you know, there is a book on that, on how to be creatively bugged, that a lot of guys don't know just how to be angry anymore. I mean, you know, they, they, hear, they hear all these very hip... They, 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 read, they read Pfeiffer, for example, and they feel cheated. Why wasn't I mad at that? <laughs> Crying out loud, you know. Uh, if you could get just about a quarter of a step ahead of the rest of the crowd, you could become syndicated. Get yourself a record and, you know, make it, make it big. It's, it's a very difficult problem, but uh, it, it's, it's leading us into some wild, turbulent waters. And I think one of the wildest bits of turbulent water that we're going to encounter in a long time is the obvious fact that uh, America has developed a very new tangent. Bob, are you aware of this? Yes, that no matter what political stripe you are, whether you're Democrat, Republican, or whether you're conservative or liberal, whether you're just angry or bugged, whether you're hip or square, whatever, whatever stripe you are, that whatever happens to us or the world, whatever happens in the world is because somebody loused up in the government. Somebody did it. Uh, this is an interesting attitude. It never was like that before. You know, if oh, sure. It, so, you know, always people blamed other people for stuff. But it was never universal. Now, no matter what, <laughs> what happens, the, the, the Democrats will demand an investigation. The Republicans demand an investigation. The liberals will march with signs. And the conservatives will plot to burn down the city hall. And, and no matter what happens, if it happens in Tibet, you know, that's a very interesting new problem. It's as though... Every time Mickey Mantle hit a home run, we blamed Warren Spahn. You know? <laughs> Which I'm sure some fans do, or whoever's pitching. So you're sitting out there. You know, there's two ways to look at, a, at an event. Uh, when, when let's, let's, say, uh, let's say that uh, Juan Pizarro is pitching. Pizarro is pitching good ball, see? Uh, he's allowed three hits. It's in the eighth inning. Now, come on, cut it out. Now, what are you doing that for? Don't start picking your nose at this hour. Now, wait till it's over. So Juan Pizarro is pitching. See, everybody, all of a sudden, that's the little thing. I'll never forget a guy on stage at a great big show I saw. It's wild. The, the, it, was, it was a sense, it was, it was a beautiful production of a Hamlet. And some lout who's standing in the back row holding up a cardboard spear starts scratching. At the precisely wrong moment, forget it. Poor Olivier should have stayed home in his igloo. I mean, and John Gielgud was dead, and this, this, this cretinous lout was scratching. He scratched and scratched and scratched, 
And, and, and I, I know what was happening to 2,000 people in the audience because I could just see all the heads go <laughs> like that. And they waited, you see, while he get, and he scratched all the way through two complete soliloquies, a monologue and a dueling scene. <laughs> so remember that. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, uh, and, oh, incidentally, what was so fascinating was that later that night, everybody went home and thought, you know, there was something lacking in tonight's, but I don't know, it just didn't have the zing that it usually had. Sure, they should have decapitated that lout five minutes before the curtain went up or got him deloused. I don't know which or the other, you know. I mean, he had that problem that a lot of people have. But uh, while, while getting back, <laughs> while getting back to the problem here, uh, <laughs> we are living in wild times. Where I'm fascinated with all this business of Hoppe, you know, making his comments uh, about we 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 live in a time now where where laws are literally viewed upon as things that bug us personally. You know, they take, get rid of law because that law is bugging me. And uh, it's a persecution, that law, which is a very interesting attitude towards our, our, our society. And I imagine that if Al Capone were around today, somebody would think to do a one-hour program called Al Capone Tells You What He Thinks of the FBI. And, uh, and he would be listened to seriously, you know, They'd seriously listen to what he has to say about it, which, uh, which leads to an interesting problem in American jurisprudence. And any good lawyer will will tell you the problem involved, and uh, it it has it it's, it's wildly interesting to me, and I can see all around everywhere you look, there is a peculiar kind of feeling that the government is cheating. Uh, primarily, I suppose, because the world isn't going the way we like it. Uh, one of the one of the most interesting remarks made about the subject of this whole business of say, for example, w one of the big things they're talking about today is uh, news managing. Well, oh yeah, managing the news. You know, but you've heard about this, you see. And uh, what's what's fascinating is that that the management of news, which is called in other circles public relations, is as <laughs> is as much a part of the American way of life, believe me, as Mother's Day. And uh, it really is. And we, we, every company, every, I'll tell you, the New York Times has got a PR outfit. I know this. Which is devoted to, to creating the New York Times image. Uh, it's fascinating. If a paper manages the news, it calls itself editorializing. It sets itself off. And, and in the end, uh, the idea of managing news is very interesting because one of the reporters recently made the comment that the, that the current administration is far more open to reporters than any administration has been in, in, in recent memory. In other words, a reporter can actually get in and talk to people. So he is finding out an interesting thing. I think we are. That the more open you are, the more people suspect you when things happen. Uh, many a good actor, many a good star, for example, has found out that you will be honored. The more you remove yourself from the people, the more you will be honored. The more you get among the people, the more they'll start out. Hey, for crying out loud, Olivier. Hey, Larry, Larry. And if, if, if Lawrence Olivier threw his doors open and argued with every 15-year-old drama student every night after his, after his program and after his show, within, within six months, he would be a bum among them, no matter how well he performed. Why? No one knows. Uh, if, for example, J.D. Salinger were to invite every undergraduate from Princeton up every afternoon for beer... Within six weeks, he would be a bum among them. I can guarantee you this. And every undergraduate of Princeton is yelling now. I can hear... No, I'm sorry, Dad. The third day, when he would say something you wouldn't like, you would get into a hassle, and ten minutes later, you would go stamping out saying he's a bum and a phony, and that would end it. Uh, as long as he remains distant from you, you have respect for him. Uh, it's, the, it's an interesting problem. It really is. Uh, you, you, you want the very thing that you don't want, and the very thing you do want destroys you. And I suspect that, uh, that, uh, that there is a thing creeping through the American system that is very new, uh, and that is that we have a tendency today to look upon everything that does happen across the world as somehow we've loused up. It's the kind of acceptance of universal guilt, you know, no matter what it is. If the locusts eat the rice crop in Tibet, 
Why didn't the agricultural department do something about it? They could have known the locusts were coming for crying out loud. Now look at the Tibetans turning. We sold the Tibetans. Now look at that. We sold out Tibet. And uh, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. It winds up like that all the year, year after year. And so I'm just curious what the eventual result will be. Not so much what is going on now. I'm curious what it will be like ten years from now. It's going to be an interesting world. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm very curious about it. Oh, one more thing, too, I've noticed, and that is the development of a fascinating new uh, aspect of the American attitude, and that is to feel that anybody who is in the government, by definition, is dishonest. He's a politician. Have you known that, creeping around, Bob? Why, he's a politician. Who believes? And so we've come to the point now, we've sunken so low, where we will actually believe a nightclub comic is telling more truth about any given world situation than, say, uh, the State Department attaché. Fascinating. You know, this is exactly what happened in one very famous mid-European country just before one very famous late ex-dictator took over. A universal distrust of the government per se. Intriguing problem. Speaking, oh, speaking of the trust, this is WOR AM and FM, New York. We'll be here until, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not making any political comments. I don't want you to say, well, who is the son of a gun pro Kennedy or he's pro this, pro that? I'm not. I'm just saying that the, there is something floating around in our world. It began, I would say, roughly towards the middle of the Eisenhower administration when it became quite evident subconsciously to a lot of people that a lot of problems that had seemed momentary problems were not momentary problems and were were rapidly gaining momentum. And so we began to, to cast around wildly for, for scapegoats. It's like a person who has cancer and blames the doctor. And in fact, many people do. I've heard people say, ah, you get operated for cancer, you go right away, you're dead. Let them operate on you, you're dead. The implication meaning that, that when the doctor works on you, obviously he is not only aiding cancer, but probably is behind it. You've heard that many times, haven't you, Bob? It's an intriguing uh, attitude. Uh, and it is becoming prevalent in the American scheme of things. Very, very, very deadly thing developing. Where uh, you can gain an audience, believe me, you can gain an audience on any given college campus by talking against the system, per se. It has nothing to do with politics. I wonder how many people know that most of the young people today are totally apolitical. They are neither what could be called Republicans, nor what could be called Democrats. And in fact, uh, they, are, they are two extremes of something else. Uh, most of them are what they call themselves, or they don't even call themselves Republicans. They call themselves conservatives or liberals, uh, but they will not associate themselves with any party. Intriguing. Uh, they, they feel that they are outside. And, and so there is a new thing growing in this country which is not going to blow away. Believe me, it's not just going to take wings and fly away. It's, it's like uh, five years ago, guys said, ah, the beatnik thing's a fad. Uh, forget it. Uh, that is also coupled with a new, another new development, which has not been really reported on to a great extent, and that's the development of a kind of perennial teenagerism among adults. Uh, that that uh, right now, probably, there are, there's uh, a, a large number of guys listening right now down in the village, for example. They, they gather in various places, but it's not only in the village. A large group of people, a large, it's particularly among males, very intriguing, of men who are roughly in their oh, early 30s, who look upon themselves as kind of like 19 and who look upon the rest of the world as composed of grown-ups. <laughs> I actually had a guy, a friend of mine, who I know is pushing 35, say to me the other day, we were sitting there talking, and he, he with an absolute straight face, uh, I was talking about something, he was talking about something, and, and he turned to me with a straight face, and he says, yeah, I said, but for crying out loud, all you grown-ups got the same idea like that. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, man? He says, well, you know, I said, ah. well, uh, it's, uh, it's a kind of perennial teenagerism which uh, develops the, it's as though a 35-year-old man feels that he's secretly holding Caulfield. He's 16-year-old and he's continually complaining about the kid in the shower with pimples and showing the fact that he is a loving person by doing it. 
Uh, it's a very intriguing problem developing here. And that is also a problem which, among another group of people in another well-known mid-European country, developed. There was a perpetual teenagerism in that crowd, too, which uh, was noted by several psychiatrists who were on the scene for a short time until they got decapitated after they said it. But uh, <laughs> it, uh, it's a... Uh... Oh, speaking of, uh, of tribal rituals, since we are going to speak of tribal rituals, I uh, just received a big, uh, a great big uh, folder. You know, I, I suppose uh, the, the presentation today is one of the most important art forms there is, Bob. Uh, every one of us is on about 45 mailing lists. You know the kind of stuff that you receive that says occupant, apartment 42, 3762 Cleveland Street, uh, that kind of thing, occupant, and you open it up and it says, congratulations on the top. You have been selected from 6,000 highly select people in the United States to receive the following very special offer, which will save you money and which will enable you to become a charter member of THINK the new hard-hitting magazine for sensitive thinking people. Yes, keep abreast with your fingertips on the surging, pulsing, great flow of news in this world. Know before it happens. Well, uh, there's uh, all of us are on those various things. Well, I happen to be on a very intriguing one. I, I, I don't know how I got on this one, but it's, I, I received a big, beautiful 14-color, 758-square-inch brochure, which must have cost like $9,000 to print. And it's a big thing. And it is about one of America's great tribal rituals. And I will read to you what it's about. It is about... And there in the center of this lovely 14-color brochure is a picture of a crinkly-eyed, typical American woman. Not old, not young, not sexy, not sterile, not friendly, not really angry, arms outstretched in love. It is a picture as done by one of America's top loved family magazine illustrators, a picture of the typical American mom. Well, today, as you all know, looks like a combination between Betty Furness, Arlene Francis, Debbie Reynolds, with just a little touch of Sandra D. Old Ma Worth is gone. Yes, old Granny has left the scene, and Debbie steps into her place. And behind her, we can see all the American fathers in... Quiet, quiet image. The Eddie Fishers, the Bobby Darrens, and all the other great American fathers of our time. And in yellow, huge, shimmering type, it reads, Mother's Day, May 12th. Remember Mother with a gift. She'll remember. And there is Mother in true American Mother's Day, arms outstretched, receiving her beautifully wrapped, expensive gifts, showing love. And now we get into the real pay dirt of this beautiful brochure. It leads off with a statement by the President, official Mother's Day proclamation by the President, and we quote, The service rendered our country by the American Mother is the greatest source of our strength and our inspiration. Mother's Day is the most conscious and deliberate effort any nation has ever made to honor the mothers of a country. In February 1914, the Congress of the United States passed the Joint Resolution Number 25, naming the second Sunday in May of each year as Mother's Day. At that time, the then Secretary of State stated the purpose of the day as follows, to establish, promote, and perpetuate work for the well-being of the home, to give emphasis to the home as the fountainhead of the state, and that a tribute to the love of the mother and the father resolves itself into a tribute to their law, and that recognition of their law means love for country, for comrades, and for God. which is a lovely sentiment. 
And then the brochure gets right down to business by stating bluntly, There's no business like gift business. Yes, gift selling is a full markup business. It's plus business, quality business, big ticket business. And this beautiful Mother's Day display material will help a lot. The National Committee on the Observance of Mother's Day began promoting this great event in 1941, 22 years ago. Leading and successful retailers know that this committee has been the inspiration and the spearhead of this event becoming a billion-dollar resale salesmaker. And then in big, beautiful letters it says, and I think this is a slogan for all of us to bear close to our hearts, Bob. One that we could very well have reprinted thousands and thousands of times over to put above our desks along with the think sign and the one that says smile and God bless our little home. This lovely, typically American, beautifully, beautifully delineated slogan, don't sell Mother's Day short. Who can but feel a wet eye at that? Yes, you can logically begin promoting the sale of Mother's Day gift items right after Easter. Remember that merchants who do best with Mother's Day know it to be a seasoner, builder of sales, not just a one-day affair. And one last reminder to all of you out there, Mother's Day is a good time to trade up, to raise your prices. Yes, it's time to put aside price appeal for a season and stress quality selection, wrapping, and other gift considerations. Trade up. It's Mother's Day. They'll spend. Gift selling is a full markup business. It's plus business, quality business, big ticket business, and Mother's Day spearheads them all. Yes, yes, no, 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 that, just set her back, uh, you just keep right on going with that same Mother's Day music, because I thought you ought to know that we're thinking of you mothers out there. And the final, the final line, the final line, which I think kind of sums it up pretty well, it says, remember, a gift means love, and love means sales, and sales mean profits. Back Mother's Day. And it's signed the committee, the National Committee on the Observance of Mother's Day, Inc., a non-profit organization. Oh, Mother. Oh, Mother, we... As a bearer of a charger plate, we honor thee, O oh mother. Come unto me, and thy gift shall be bountiful. Yeah? No, no, honey. There we go. <laughs> there goes another mother scurrying past. <laughs> now a lot of ladies are going to say I'm anti-mother. Boy, oh boy. Just thought you ought to know that everything is going on out there. Now, I I, I just read it just the way it is. See? Just so nice, can I say... Oh, do you, you know that gift sales are now a billion-dollar business? There's something beautiful about love. Kind of. I feel it. You know, speak, we got a couple of commercials. Let's do it. We got the thing in there? There we go. Watch your finger. Uh, then you'd say folks around here have more fun because... They eat out more. Oh, they have like a lot of fun. to get to a good restaurant. <laughs> uh, Thank goodness. Whew, boy, guy almost sold me one there. Whew, that was quick. That was very, very close. Uh, speaking of... Uh, the nip and tuck problem. Oh yes, I, I'm, I, I just hope I live another ten years, Bob. I just want to know what it's going to be like. Believe me, the the, the stuff, the stuff that that five years ago that I was uh, kicking around just for kicks on the on the, the this radio station right here has not only come to be true, it has come home to haunt me. <laughs> you notice that? It's wild. Oh, speaking of the haunted, we have with us here American Heritage. Many people are bugged by their heritage. And if you want to really know what America is about and also sit down, cross your legs, merely one tiny moat in the vast eyeball of existence. 
I have no, I do not have anything to do with George Washington nor Benedict Arnold, except only by inference. Did I tell you that there was a, there was a school outside of Chicago? Actually, it's in Illinois, in a Chicago suburb, the Benedict Arnold High School. <laughs> and, 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 you know, guess what the name of their football team is? The Traitors. I'm telling you the truth. I, I'm, I'm raising my hand. I'm telling you the truth. It's the Benedict Arnold High School and the Benedict Arnold Traitors. Okay. Everybody's saying, oh, come on, you're making it up. I am not making it up because they were named the Benedict Arnold High School by a genuine sorehead who started the school years ago. And, uh, oh, really? <laughs> it's the truth. Because, you know, uh, Arnold was an interesting guy except for one wild flub. Uh, and a very good general. So there is the Benedict Arnold High School out there in Illinois. And it was only later that some wise guy coach named of the Traders. And you think I'm kidding? It's the truth. They have red, white, and blue uniforms. That's true. They, I know that there's a Patrick Henry High School. And you know what they call them? The Orators. And this is the typical of Indiana and I, Illinois. It's true. The George Washington High School. What do you think they call them? What do you think they call them? They call them the George Washington Fathers. The football team is called the Fathers. I'm serious. The Fathers of our country. That's oh Boy, I can see you are as far out of touch with the great underbelly of America as you are out of touch with the great underbelly of reality. And I am not saying that America is the great underbelly of reality. Do not add that up. Oh, boy. You know, speaking of the underbelly of reality, as long as... Oh, by the way, there's no scores tonight for all of you bookies that are listening, and forget it. You're going to have to buy papers again. Okay? All right? Sorry, fellows. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's too bad. Uh, you know, speaking of... Uh, <laughs> somebody sent me the cover of a magazine, which I will not quote, but it's a very patriotic-type magazine. And, uh, again, this is part of the, of the interesting uh, phenomenon of America that's going on at this point. It's a big red thing. It says, A plan to free Cuba by approved re revolutionary methods. Who approves what? I mean, who is... <laughs> I'm curious on, on how... Re who is it? Is it Consumers Union that approves those revolutionary methods, gives them a try out there? Who? Are, just just a little interesting question there. Interest, you know, uh, approved revolutionary methods. I suppose uh, under approved revolutionary methods, you use rubber bullets. I don't know. Or is it, or is it you, you, uh, is it you only shoot guys over six feet tall? Or, uh, or is it you wait, you have to wait two hours before you start executing guys with firing squads after a 15 minute trial? How do you set up rules for revolutions? I'm curious. I don't know. I don't know. Just, just a little. You know, speaking of, of the nuttiness that, that is almost, again, as I say, it's, it's getting to the point now where you just don't know whether, Reality is, is fiction or fiction is reality. 97% uh, of the stuff I do on the air, I get a letter from somebody within like 10 minutes saying, Oh, come on, you made it up. I did not make it up. And one of you is going to call up who went to the Benedict Arnold High School and say, Yes, I'm an old traitor. That's the truth. You think I'm just kidding you. Somebody is going to know that George Washington High School does exist out in Indiana, and they call them the fathers more properly called the dads on the sport page. I kind of like that. They call them the Washington dads. I'm telling you the truth. It's wild. I know one high school football team out there that's called the Tarantulas. Yeah, it's the football team. Like, you know, we have the blue streaks. We have the names like, why? I don't know why they call them the Tarantulas. The Spiders. So it's a rotten neighborhood. Maybe, maybe there's a reason for calling them that. I don't know. But they do come from a rotten neighborhood. The high school itself is one big rumble. As a matter of fact, it is. One big, it's, it's, they were rumbling long before they ever heard the word, long before Leonard Bernstein got hold of the idea. I can tell you that, Dad. Those guys were improvising switchblades before the Stone Age went out. <laughs> well, while we're on the subject of, of, uh, of, uh, of the juvenile delinquent world that we live in, I have here an advertisement which I would like to read to you, which I did not make up which I will read uh, word for word. Now, you've been, and I'm not going to make any editorial comment because it makes its own editorial comment. 
and uh, and it uh, you've been in uh, these various uh, uh, beautiful stainless steel elevators, haven't you? Where the music is playing, you get in there, and the music starts going. You've been in, haven't you been in one of those? Well, you just go over to one of the, the any one of the hip buildings here in town, Bob, and get in, and you'll find that the that the elevator not only takes you where you want to go, but plays music while you go. Literally. It's very interesting, or figuratively, if you prefer not to listen. Uh, I will read this ad. Now, if if we can get the chick in there off the phone and get her to, hey, hey, hello, hello, testing, will you please get hold that up? Fifty great, fantastic, that, by your hand. There we go. Now, I would like you to pick, uh, uh, yeah, that, that what we were using was pretty good, although I will tell you Narcissus is even better for this purpose here. And then we will go to, uh, Bob, we'll have to program this. Start out with Narcissus, see? Then go to my, there will always be an England music, which you know uh, is in there, okay? And then go to, hold up that other thing. Hey, Lee, baby, hold up the other thing there now. You, can, you, you know what you're, 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 any, just hold up what I've got. All the music I have. Hold it up. Records. That's better. Now, um, yes, that one, the gothic music. We will play a sequence of music here for you. Put up the gothic. You got the gothic? Any one of them. Now, here's the sequence we're going to go with. You got the, the sequence in there okay? You got uh, Narcissus. We go into the There Will Always Be in England, Thank God music. Then we go into what? The gothic music. If you don't know what it is, it reads Coronation March. Oh, yes, she remembered. Okay. Very good. All right. Now, why is it I can remember everything and nobody remembers nothing? All right. Now, the next one then after that is, uh, you got that, you got Coronation March. Now, stop talking now. You, you, uh, you go then into, uh, the Gothic. Okay. Then after the Gothic, we want Stars and Stripes Forever. All set now? Okay. Now, to begin with, here's a cat, see. He gets in. He gets. He comes into his office, see. You got it now? Okay, now. Uh, hold it for a minute, though, Bob, before we go, because we'll have to do this in two sequences. First, I will read you the ad. Give me the ad first with plain Narcissus played under it, and just keep repeating it, and then after that we'll do the sequence, okay? All right. The ad is a full-page ad in Fortune, April 1963. And it shows an angry-looking, desperate-looking chick. She's running, see? And you can see her. She's got her, her, her handbag flying out behind her, and her coat is flying. And, and under her, it's just better late than ever. A $5,000 question. Even your best employees will often unconsciously seek escape from tension, monotony, fatigue, or noise. And so you suffer from lateness, extended coffee breaks, or lunch hours, early departures... If 60 people each lose just 15 minutes a day, it costs you nearly $5,000 a year in hidden payroll expenses. Now, leading companies cut these losses with scientifically planned work music by Muzak. Muzak helps create a pleasantly stimulating work environment, provides a psychological lift. Yeah, yeah. Your people think better, work better, are less prone to errors, accidents, lateness, and time wasting. Don't confuse Muzak with its imitators. There is a special non-distracting Muzak service. Uh, we want the uh, Narcissus Bob played over and over again. There is a special non-distracting Muzak service for offices and banks, another for industrial plants. Each is precision-timed on Muzak automated equipment to give employees the correct type of musical motivation hour by hour. Inquire about a Muzak trial installation. No obligation. It's proof that Muzak helps solve people problems. Okay, now, see here. Now, here we got a guy, see? Now, we got to set up the sequence. Got it in there? No, no, we start out with Narcissus, Bob. That's You remember the sequence? Now, I'll have to give, run it over quickly so we don't get all balled up. All right. Okay, now, here's a guy, see? We, we, we see this as being done now. 
Here is total programming. See? You got it now? Okay, total programming. It is now it is now eight twelve. Charlie is twelve minutes late. He comes tearing as you know what into the office, sweating and perspiring. The reason he's there late is not because of what the people say in the ad tension, monotony, fatigue, or noise. He just hates the rotten joint. He comes arriving in. He comes sliding into his desk. And suddenly he is surrounded. And he sees that, he sees that door, that big door down at the end of the office, the one that says C.G. Bullard, VP. Rotten son of a hell. But the music rises higher and higher. Bullard comes out of the office, slams the door, walks over to the water cooler. You can see his incisor teeth hanging down all the way to his chin. But that music rises. Hey, CG, you old son of a gun. And with that, Bullard goes back into his office. Boom! The door slams, and the next bit of work program music comes on. This means get on the ball now, Henry! Pick up the ball! Thank God! The phone rings. The purchasing department is on the phone. Henry is marching forward with all of England, all of Western civilization behind him. Uh, hey, CG, send me up those invoices, will you? Yeah. Hey, Myrtle, have you got those mimeograph copies of 437 done yet? Let's go for crying out loud. Let's pick up that load. Let's put that mail. Let's lift that barge. Get a little drunk and you land in jail. Let's go. Oh, it's, God, it's great to be here. It's great to be lifting this barge and toting this bale, moving all these papers around from one basket to the other, making all these great phone calls. Hello, Pete, you old son of a gun. Get on the ball down there. Get them things going. Oh. Now you see. For one brief moment, it has been noted by the music people that immediately after... Oh, you cut it too quick. I wanted that next trumpet blast there. One brief moment after... He has been inspired by this gigantic coronation march through the westward countries, all through the great glacial-covered plains of boredom and ennui, because he hates this rotten joint. They have to bring on a... Oh, well, that's all right. You can bring on Le Prelude. That'll be all right. They have to bring on a gigantic trumpet blast. Oh, yeah. Excuse me, fellas. Stereophonic, with highs, with lows, with middle range. With accordions, with xylophones, with trumpets. Bum, 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 bum. By God, he's doing bum, 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 bum. His stapler is red hot. His stamp is worn down to an oven. But you can keep Henry at top peak only just so long. He is now released for lunch. Fourteen. Martinis later, seven tuna salad sandwiches and four completely draining gripes to all of his friends around him. He is now back in the office, and the next phase begins. Ah, oh, yes. This is what the Muzak people call the liturgical or the elegiacal. Elijah, elegiac, elegiac, elegiacal. This means now that you are in a Gothic temple, Henry, that we are here for keeps. The tradition of the C.G. Bullard Company stands behind you, way behind you. Yes, that great temple of the mimeograph room. Thousands of solid, hard-working peasants have died, have died, each one of them contributing his little bit of blood to the C.G. Bullard Corporation. Blah, blah, blah. A march will not work at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. One must have, one must perforce go deep into the religious, deep into the inner man. Trumpets blare, great gothic horns blow. Yes, that's true, Pete. You're right, Pete. We owe something to C.G. Bullard. Come, 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 come. Now he is stamping with a man with a religious fervor upon him. Come, 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 come. 
a man whose conscience is nagging at him. Come, 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 come. Who knows he is a sinner after them 14 martinis? Come, 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 come. He is stamping and pushing. All the way till five minutes to five. He is off at 5.15. They got to get that last 20 minutes out of him. That last 20... Get going, Henry. It's God. It's home. It's mother. You can't let down the grand old flag. You cannot now. Yes, they're coming over the horizon. Don't shoot them crumbs until you see the whites of their eyes. My God, Henry, don't goof off now. Every man must kill to the last ounce of his blood. Rick and the thing, thing, thing. Stars and stripes forever in the field of waving grain, Henry. Only seven more minutes. Seven more minutes, Henry. Only five more minutes. Two more minutes. One more minute, Henry. Thirty seconds, Henry. Go, Henry. Go, 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 go. Ten seconds. Go, 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 go. Okay, CG, I'll call you in the morning. Five seconds, Henry. Don't give up yet. Three seconds, two seconds, one second, zero. Henry is gone. Boom. And Muzak brought him through. Keep your knees loose, Dad. This is WOR Radio, your station for news.